cranial base problem, and the maxilla, if the cranium isn't forward, the maxilla tends not to be forward. It looks like a maxillary deficiency, but it's also an anterior cranial base shortage. Now we come back to the pterygoid vertical, and what do we see in the joint? This is short here. So if I have shortness here and shortness here, class 3. Now let's compare the actual length in the mandible. What's the difference in the size of the mandible? <coughs> Not much difference in size, but a difference in form. Size one's obtuse, and one's more acute. Now, the lower molar is the same in both of them. The teeth are compensating for the concave profile. Now, here I am superimposed on the facial plane. Here's the normal, here's the class 3. So you can see now, really, what makes up a class 3. Now, we superimpose on the maxilla, and the upper teeth are back on a maxilla that's already back. Everybody, the first thing comes to mind, oh, I got a big mandible, I'm class three. Mm, well, in these five, it's obtuse to be sure, and it is maybe a millimeter long. But where's the majority of the problem? Now, since we're doing it, here's the class two. With high convexity. Okay, what does what the class 2 do to? See, here's the 8-year-old norm. And here's the class 2s. Now what do we see? All right, now let's look at the cranial base in these cases. The anterior cranial base is a little long. The maxilla is forward and down compared to the normal. The maxillary teeth are protrusive on a maxilla that's already forward. The cranial base here, instead of being normal, is back. The mandible has a normal length. <laughs> the lower molar is normal. So what does a class 2 do to it? Let's then take the class 3 and compare it to the class 2. This is age 8, 8, 8 and a half. Let's compare the two of them then. In the cranial base, nasion is about 7 millimeters difference. Over a centimeter in the maxilla. The condyle forward, the condyle back. And when we compare it to pterygoid vertical, PTV. maybe 3 millimeters difference there. The length of the mandible a little bit longer in the class 3 and more obtuse. But superimposing over the mandible, look at the difference in the position of the upper arch, almost absolute orientation of the lower first molar. So the thing that's most likeness in the two cases is the lower first molar to the corpus axis. So are we right in classifying from the upper first molar? In other words, the class 2 should be the mesial occlusion. And the class 3 should be the distal occlusion. Look at it. Now you can you can imagine my chagrin when the first time I saw this. Right. Now, now, here's the group then that were treated with reverse headgear. Again, now at age 13. So we treated these in a mixed and then the permanent dentition. And it had them in retention by the age of 13. Now, let's look at this and see what happened. Facial axis didn't change. In other words, we didn't open the mandible and sustain it. But what did we do? Look at the maxilla forward position. We go back in position two. Now you see I moved the whole maxilla forward. Now we go up and superimpose over the maxilla and I moved the teeth forward on the maxilla. Arch length 24, right up to normal. Upper arch length 
it's forward of where it should be 16. So this whole thing is forward, so we've got it in harmony with the forward mandible, the 93 facial angle. So I've got these teeth in pretty good harmony. That's not a bad profile for 13. Now, let's, let's do the final thing of this little experiment. Here's the treated class 3s, and here's the treated class 2s. This has 91, this has 89. So there's, there's type here. And they're both age 13. The mandible here has grown more than the class 2 did. But the interesting thing is now, as we superimpose on position two, we've got the maxillas about even. The class two, the maxilla was ahead. Class three, now they're about even. So orthopedically, the maxilla. So let's get a 13-year-old normal. So let's get a 13-year-old normal. Here we are at 13 normal. Here's the class 2 treated. Are the lips normal in the treated group? Pretty good. How about the face? The class 2 is back a little bit. But look where we started. Now the class 3. It's bigger than normal, so it has grown. But if we put it on the profile, lips are pretty close. Now we analyze the class three, and you see we brought the maxilla forward, brought the maxillary teeth forward, moved the mandibular teeth back, while the patient's grown on the facial axis. Instead of growing two and a half, they grow three millimeters. So in the prediction of class three mandibles with obtuse mandibles, that's predictable. We just go three millimeters on the arc instead of the two and a half. And add, according to the length of the condyle, that much more. One of the things we're very good at is predicting class three. Here's a group of patients starting at age 12. There's uh, 14 of them. Now I'll tell you about this group. Several years ago, I went to Harriet, who has been with me for 20 years. She went thank you. So I asked her one day to find me all of the cases that were started after age 12 with high convexity class two open bites that had been treated without extraction. Number one, after age 12, open bite. Open bite Class two, high convexity that were treated non-extraction. So two weeks later, I said, Harriet, can I have that list? She says, I'm still looking. One week later, how's that list coming, Harriet? I can't find any. Oh, come on. How about this one? No. How about that one? No. I said, you mean we don't have any? She says, well, name one. I could not find one single case. Well, if I've got an open bite, class two, I can back to Not low convexity. High convexity. I'm going to extract it. So I couldn't find any of these. So I, I said, okay, well, give me the ones we had. So she went to the file and pulled out 14 of them, all who had been extracted. There is one of the indications for extraction. Now here's the group afterwards. Mandible ro rotated open despite us. We got some orthopedics. And the lower molar was moved upward and forward and backward and, up, and, upward and backward in the incisor. The facial axis stayed about 85. So I imagine you have a few of these around Japan. 85 facial axis, 51, 66, 86, 17 and a half. And of course the upper would be about five more. So, and it'd be reduced to six from the 29, so that'd be about 23. Yeah, for 23. So that, look at the reduction here of the 
arch length. And look how much anchorage we lost in the treatment of those cases. Look, no. look, look how much forward movement of the molar there was. Because we were actually losing anchorage in the upper, so the lower had to be brought more. That's a lot of tooth movement in order to achieve that result without surgery. So you see why a lot of people are trying to turn to surgery in these kind of cases today. And what I'll do in some of these patients is to take out upper incisor, upper uh, uh, premolars only. And then we'll do a genioplasty, a sliding genioplasty. I hope you appreciate what you're seeing here, because it's taken me a whole career to bring you this kind of information. I don't know where any, anywhere else in the world you'll go to get it. This is a patient that was sent to me by Dr. Boyko, a class two open bite. A NICU open bite. And the mixed dentition. He treated it with an activator. Yeah. He treated it with a Harvold activator. A Harvold. Let's examine what happened in the course of treatment with a removable device. Oh, yes. This is a single case. I will show you first this single one, and then we'll show you a group of them. But I was impressed with this case. Here's position one, and you can see the mandible was closed down about four degrees. Now, position two, so move the incisors back, and the upper molar was held with the maxilla. Where do you see the biggest change? Position of the lower incisor. So the lower arch has been changed about four millimeters. So this over jet then has been accomplished by tipping the upper incisors upright, moving the lower arch forward, tipping the lower incisors forward, and forward growth of the mandible. All right, here is a group of 20 cases, 23 cases, that were sent by Boyko. These are manual, made from data. What strikes you right off? 92 facial axis, 55 facial nomon. Right off the bat, what everybody else has said for a long time. You want to use an activator in a class two. It works best in brachyfacial pattern because the mandibular growth comes in and supports the, 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 the appliance. So I was impressed. So much impressed was I that I made a trip to Toronto. And Boyko was a good friend of mine. I stayed with him in his home. And he took me down to his office and I said, I want to see these patients. They were little normal kids. And I reopened the door for mandibular posturing mm -hmm. mechanics. In 1961, I went to South America. It was an international meeting in Montevideo, Uruguay. I uh, stopped off at Seu Paulo, Brazil on the way in, in the Rio de Janeiro, uh, lectured in both of those cities, and put a course on in Buenos Aires, uh, Buenos Aires Argentina. And as you know, most of those people down there or a lot of those people were from Germany. Argentina supplies most of the beef for Hitler in World War II. Mm. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, Bimler was under the impression that uh, he was making a mandible grow. And I will never forget the shock and the dismay on the faces mm. of those people down there when I showed them that cervical traction had better growth in the mandible than the appliances they were using. He didn't have any orthopedics in the maxilla. In position three, the same thing that we saw in the Boyko cases, and the same thing in the mandible, the forward movement of the lower arch. We take the Bimler mandible and we go in and predict it with the arc the way that I showed you. And this is the amount of growth that we get in four years. So I go in now and see whether or not that prediction works out. So I'm pretty convinced by now that posturing with the Bimler device did not make a mandible grow. That you couldn't tell, I couldn't tell which one of the appliances between the Bimler the activator and the bionator. So I, took, I took all the composites and put them together. We came up there with this as a composite of the composite. It represented 138 patients. 
When I got him, it was 90, 60. So it seems as though the mean of the group were in class twos were selected and it worked in patients that already were brachyfacial. Now the mean change then was、uh, two and a half years later. There was a one degree opening of the facial axis. It went from 90 to 89. Now these are all removable. The oral nomon was 43, now it's 45. There was a five millimeter convexity, which is now three. You know, the occlusion is not bad. It's 132 plus two. So let's not knock it. The, uh, uh, the, the appliances, the mandibular plastering, removable appliances, any one of them can do a job, particularly in the brachyfacial. These are patients that treated with a combination of headgear plus mandibular posturing. You notice they're not easy cases. They're 70 millimeters of convexity, or 87. So he's tackling a little bit harder case here on average. So now you see some backward movement of the upper molar. Now you've got a little bit of change in. The internasal spine.、Uh -huh. He's got something positively happening in the maxilla. Now, further, he hasn't displaced the lower denture forward. Now, this is only first stage, and he's still got a lot of overjet. And these cases then were only a little bit over a year in duration. So that's pretty effective for the first year. So with that, he has rotated the mandible open a little bit. I was treating、uh, an older sister. And this is the one that I took records on at the age of five.、Uh, if you notice, she has a 93 facial axis. And uh, uh, she was a thumb sucker. Put her under observation for a little while because the parents didn't have enough to pay for two kids at once, apparently. And I didn't see her for two and a half years. Now she comes in at age eight. Now we can go in and do our four position analysis. And you notice now by superimposing on CC, she grew downward and forward. And in two and a half years, how much would that be? It's.、Uh, Five millimeters. So there wasn't anything more than average growth. Maybe a little less than average. Well, you can see now that she is a good bit more protrusive than she was before. So growth didn't help us a bit there. Even though she was 93 on the facial axis. Now the permanent teeth follow the deciduous teeth. And you can see now that she's erupted into a class two. Even worse than what she had at the beginning. The lower molar has erupted backward a little bit. She's a thumb sucker, still is. It's obvious that she's not going to improve with growth. Let's go in now at the age of eight, and we're going to put her on a headgear. We had some talking to do with her. To get her to stop her thumb because we showed her now how much worse she was than when she started. And so we were able to talk her out of her, tongue, her thumb habit. So I'm going to put a headgear now on her second deciduous molar, second to first permanent molar. So here she was now in a super class one by the age of 11. When we use a headgear, we expect to get a class two corrected in one year to a year and a half. Just with natural growth. And we try to get 14 hours, and we ask for 14 hours. I think we average closer to 12 hours. Remember that cellular activity is best during the sleep. After we get it corrected, we don't stop it. We cut it down to every other night and we lighten it up for the first four months. The second four months, it's every third night. The last one, it's one night a week. I'm telling you how to use a headgear. If you have a high convexity, class two, like this, and we're going to go through the general principles involved in each one of the appliances that we use. We think of it as a skeletal appliance first. If you're not careful and you start it out with a low convexity, you will make. A class three face out of it. So here's your 
orthopedics in a high convexity case. You put uh, the face bow up to the outside a little bit. This is my design of a headgear. And that is about a centimeter above the level of the crown of the tooth. If I have an occlusal word, it means to offset the tip back. If I have the, if I have the tube on the occlusal side, in order to prevent it from tipping, I have to bend it up more, which causes it to extrude more. We even offset it above the level of the band so that we're nearer to the centroid of the root. So if the tube is up higher, the force is more active on the root. I tell the child it's like putting a piece of lead in a lead pencil. They understand that very well. A child, however, that uses it will be able to put it in without a mirror. I had a child one day that told me that he could put his elastics on with his tongue. I said, let's see you. So he took one out, flipped it here, put it in his mouth, hooked it under his molar, <laughs> and hooked it up and it had, it, it had the class two elastic. <laughs> so I said, the next step is to throw it in the air and catch it in the tubes. <laughs> but you all, I always like to see a child that comes in and I said, have you got your headgear with you? And I start to put it on, they say, here, let me. Whenever I see that, I know I've got a cooperator. But if he has to get up, go to the mirror, and fuss and fool around, I want to kick him <laughs> on the way over. Because I know he isn't doing it. So there's a lot of ways of seeing whether or not a child is wearing one of these or not. The teeth should be a little bit mobile. There should be a monthly progress. But even the parent will notice. I say a monthly progress. I love a mother to come in and say, is it possible? But I think I see a difference already after the first visit. To keep a child motivated if you have a bad motivator. One of the things you want to do is to make a game out of it. Like I told you, most children are romantics. <laughs>